Welcome, John, to the uh, Center of um, Origin and Function of Meta-Organisms here at Keele University. It's a great pleasure. We had you here about seven years ago, June 21st, 2016. It was a great pleasure. It was the, the opening uh, symposium of our um, DFG Research Center. So great that you are back. Things have changed or have moved in seven years. And uh, you are the director of the Institute of Comparative Genomics at uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, major uh, researcher, scholar in the field of uh, cellular evolution, of genome evolution, uh, technology uh, development in these aspects. Um, it's an honor that you are here. And. Um, before we may start to talk about more science, but um, how did you get, you are a protistologist, uh, you would try to understand the evolution of a cell, which is very complex. Um, how did you get into that field? How did, who draw you into this? Uh, it's very specific and it's a very specialized field, but how did you get there? Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, the first book I recall ever reading about science had nothing to do with microbes. It was a book called Lucy. It was about mm -hmm. Australopithecus, so early human evolution. And I think it was somehow reading that book that kind of gave me the idea that this was something that I was drawn to. And when that, I was... That was at the age of... What? Oh, gosh, I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't it's tell cool. you. I still have a copy of the book. Uh -huh. I can't tell you what year it was, but yeah. I was sort of a... Yeah somehow transitioning from high school to, to university. But, yeah. um, you know, studied biology in university, and that led me to study mitochondrial DNA mm -hmm. for an honors project, so a fourth-year mm -hmm. research project. And I think I just stumbled into that position. Mm -hmm. I was knocking on doors. I wanted a, a summer job mm -hmm. doing research, and this person was working on mm -hmm. uh, mollusks, on muscles, mitochondrial DNA, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. got, in, got me interested in organelles. Uh, and then really when it came time to find a lab for graduate school, that led me to the lab of someone named Ford Doolittle, who was a mentor mm -hmm. of mine mm -hmm. and generated some of the first, you know, DNA sequence data. Mm -hmm proving the endosymbiont hypothesis mm -hmm. for the, where mitochondria come mm -hmm. from. So that's mm -hmm. kind of how I got into mm -hmm. cell biology, evolution, and really got passionate about, you know, genomes and DNA as sort of trackers of evolutionary mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. Wow, very interesting. So the, the functioning of mitochondria and then asking the question, where do they come from? Yes. And uh, so, yeah, how does the cell evolve? That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, Thinking back, the last time you've been here, seven years, um, you're a director of a research center on genome evolution, uh, cellular evolution. Um, I think technologically, a lot has changed, or uh, I mean, we have now much better um, technologies and, and tools to dissect the question you obviously were interested in since, since childhood. Um, is that true also for your field? Oh, absolutely. You know, you mentioned technology. So DNA sequencing is really a central element um, of the research that goes on in my lab. Um, Can you explain us a bit in a, yeah. so in a few sentences uh, why why that's the, so the sequencing technology is so important what you can learn, yeah. uh, which, what you couldn't learn before? Yeah, I mean, DNA is the... Is the, the uh, hereditary material of life. It's chemically rather simple, but the amount of information that can be stored, biological information, is immense. Uh, and so a DNA sequence is this string of these four chemical letters, A, C, G, and T. And uh, genomes are, are very large. They store lots of information and embedded within the genome is, is the genes. And that's, again, it, uh, the DNA sequences store information. We can compare the genes from one species to the next. Now, we can why, do, why do I need to know that to understand the evolution of the cell? Yeah. Well, I mean, there are evolution before the molecular evolution. Of course, people were studying evolution using you know morphology and so forth. So for macroscopic organisms, you could compare 
uh, what the wings of butterflies looked like and compare them across species. So morphology is one obvious way of doing that. I think molecular sequencing really changed everything insofar as if you're interested in microbes like I am. Well, obviously they're microscopic by definition, but there's a lot of uh, interesting biology there that can be coaxed out of the, the DNA sequences that really uh, is really hard to get at. Uh, and so it's, it's opened up a, you know, an entirely new world, the, the microbiome, the diversity of microorganisms on life. And DNA sequencing is a big part of that. Yeah. Uh, th thinking beyond the sequencing per se, if I look in your institute, you have a very different uh, experts there. I mean, isn't that also a challenge that are bringing together people from different disciplines? It certainly is. I would say, you know, modern genomics being based on DNA sequencing, it generates a lot of information and that information is stored on computers. So one of the challenges and opportunities there is to bring together biologists and people who study you know molecular biology they're interested in questions to do with organismal diversity for example with computer science uh, and, and you know mathematicians statisticians sort of the data people here and i think there's a very rich fertile ground at the interface between biology and informatics mm -hmm. and you know genomics has really exploded and more and more it, it involves really people who have strengths in both of those areas because they they're inadequate in isolation yeah but they also need i think a third category and this is also what you are in person i mean They need a real biologist or a protistologist who knows some weird cells living in some weird environments. And uh, um, without that, I mean, you, you know, from whom to sequence, from whom you take the, the DNA and do the sequencing, and not to speak about the, the, the bioinformatics. How do you manage to bring these all together? A and B. Um, Is that already incorporated in some teaching programs then, this interdisciplinarity? Yes, absolutely. You know, the earlier I mentioned the sort of morphology. Well, you know, with, with proper modern microscopes, there is, a, there is a morphology at the level of individual cells, which is mm -hmm. uh, you know, historically, I would say, underappreciated, but, but also very, a very rich history scientifically, the field of protistology. So studying eukaryotic microbes, single-celled organisms that are not bacteria, but are their own entities. And of course, the world is full of these. Mm -hmm. And bef long before DNA sequencing, there was a, a rich history of mm -hmm. people studying them. It's a bit of a lost art, I would say. And our institute at Dalhousie, we're fortunate to have people who are trained classically in protistology. Mm -hmm. They can recognize Uh, organisms of interest mm -hmm. when they see them. Mm -hmm. And as you say, they're, they're, uh, it, it takes special training. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'd like to think that we're trying to carry on that legacy and bring it back and, mm -hmm. and teach young students that, mm -hmm. hey, there's this exciting you know, microbial world mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. It's morphology, it's uh, ecology, mm -hmm. uh, it's all of these things. We can use DNA technologies to augment our understanding, but it certainly doesn't replace, mm -hmm. you know, the biology and, and the knowledge that comes from that. Mm -hmm. Can you transfer the enthusiasm which you have certainly about uh, cells and history of cells in a evolutionary, but also science history, can you transfer that enthusiasm to sequencing experts and, uh, you know, gurus who know all kind of technologies and have never seen any organism live? <sighs> It can be a challenge, but I think a picture says a thousand words. I think exposure, regular exposure to the excitement of, of uh, the microbial world is, is certainly a starting point. Um, people come again at, at comparative genomics from two different directions. You know, biologists will have had that in their training. The, the uh, computer scientists, the math stats folks, perhaps they've not been exposed to it, but it's a very rare individual who's not excited when they see things yeah. that really look like uh, you know organisms from outer space yeah well they exist you yeah, yeah. just have uh, to look that's fantastic when young students are coming uh, like you were in, in your beginning of the career are they more 
organismic oriented or more technology oriented and said, yeah, I want to do now this bioinformatic analysis. And uh, so what's the, what's your experience? Yeah, I would say more and more students are, uh, I would say technologically aware and they're certainly computer and, you know, bioinformatically savvy. You know, I think just it's a different era now, students coming up than, than when I was, was an undergraduate. But um, I wouldn't say that they're opposed to, you know, being exposed to the excitement of that, that biology in the hidden microbial realm, as I, as I call it. It's, it's just exposure. So I think they will, a certain subset of them will take to it if they, if they know that, that it's there. And again, the, the sort of confluence of different... Uh, technological approaches, the, the genomics, the computers, which th most students are just naturally with it these days, and the microscopy, you know, incredible imaging technologies as well. Put all those things together. It's very, very powerful. Yeah, yeah, wow, very exciting. Uh, um, spending a, a minute on the organisms you're working on, um, I assume that technological progress also allows now to study organisms and cells, which were very hard to, to, uh, to um, examine and investigate in depth um, previously. Brings me to this uh, in, in, in our community here. We always talk about model organisms and non-model organisms and uh, non-model model organisms and, you know, all these things. And I think technological progress has made it unnecessary anymore to talk about that because I think uh, if you find something interesting out in, in a river or in the sea, probably you can make it to a model of your question. Is, would you agree? I, yeah, I would agree 100%. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of in this realm of single cell biology. I mean, there's cell biology, which is a thing, but single cell biology, that is the ability quite literally to study the biology of single cells uh, with sophisticated technologies. And, and that's single cell sequencing. So quite literally plucking a single organism and being able to sequence its genome mm -hmm. or its transcriptome, so the expressed genes. Mm -hmm. You can do sophisticated imaging on single cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was never possible uh, you know, in, in years and decades past. Mm -hmm. uh, and it means you don't need to be able to culture the organism mm -hmm. in the lab. Yeah. And uh, the model organism, well, I mean, that's a term that uh, has been around a long time. There's no substitute for the power that comes along with organisms that have been studied for many years, the ability to genetically you know, manipulate them, examine them in controlled environments. But increasingly, the, I would say the the length of time between new organism from nature and having the the substrate for a, a proper model organism in the traditional sense i think that gap has uh, yeah. shrunk dramatically and it's yeah. primarily yeah. technology driven yeah, yeah. that's uh, in in retrospect and i think it's just really wonderful that we we are not you know we are not stuck to the mouse and to drosophila and to the elegans but we now can really exploit the richness of nature um, with some restrictions, I agree. And genetic engineering and is not will not be possible in, in all cells we, we have. But yeah, it's, it's yeah, terrific and very, very exciting. Really exciting times, I guess, also for the younger generation uh, because they have now all that. You, know, you started your career, I started my career. I mean, we were very... I, I probably I didn't know that the cells have DNA when I you know when I entered university or something like that. But life has changed. Um, let's change topic a bit and think about the younger generation. I mean, what does it need for a young, enthusiastic student um, to be successful in in academic research? It's a changing landscape, I would say. That is. A question I think you know as, as group leaders we get more and more you know perhaps fewer academic jobs I mean it varies around the world and, and so forth but in general I would say having alternate career paths to traditional academia is something that is always good advice to give people 
it, it may be because ultimately someone might decide that traditional academic career is not what they want, but they're, it, they can be exposed to other things like science writing, you know, you know, journalism, biotech. It really depends on the sort of person. But for anyone really entertaining uh, you know, uh, an academic career, I think th there's two things I would say. One is don't, um, don't be afraid to change your mind and shift directions. I think a lot of times people think that, well, I, you know, maybe I'm a, a postdoc and I'm heading on to applying for a faculty life, or I'm a grad student and applying for a postdoc. Gosh, you know, I'm I'm locked into what I've been studying already. I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. Naturally, we're we're inclined to think that way. So, don't be afraid to change, and also, don't. Uh, underscore, you know, don't don't worry too too much about the 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 sort of the details of exactly, you know, how a per particular position perhaps is going to play out. I think there's a long game there that as and I, I can say this 20 years into yeah. your faculty life that really it's about the 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 enjoyment, the fundamental enjoyment and uh, discovery process of doing science, I think focusing on what one really likes, uh, you know, day to day, year to year, and focusing on that, I think, really is the key to long term success as a scientist. You know, short term success that can come at, at a cost, and uh, I think the long game is really what I encourage my my trainees who are serious about academic life. If they're making a decision about a this position over that position. Mm -hmm. There's there's the university, the nature of the position, but there's also everything else where you're living. All you know, quality of life is incredibly important to being a happy, productive scientist because it's it's certainly not a race, uh, uh, and it's not even a marathon. You know, it's just you living your life doing science that you find personally fulfilling. I think that's in the long run that's the most important thing to me. Mm -hmm. Very good, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, coming to the end, but uh, looking maybe a bit ahead of, uh, so you follow us here, we follow you, we are uh, colleagues and friends since a long time. Um, it seems like technology is important, interdisciplinarity is important, enthusiasm is important, of course, and we have probably found answers to a number of questions, but where will we be, where will you be? in trying to understand cellular evolution in five or 10 years, or the other side of the question would be, what are major black boxes still in the field um, which have to be solved, or maybe they are very difficult to solve? What do you think? You know what? I think, I think we're still at the stage where we don't even know enough to know what we don't know okay. about. <laughs> very good. Uh, about microbial diversity and evolution. It, and I, I say that as someone who has studied, you know, DNA sequence data and genomes for a long time. Um, there, there is no sense in which the rate of discovery is slowing down when it comes to the microbial realm. Um, you know, the ocean is one area that we focused on a lot, but, you know, pick an environment, soil, uh, you know, you, you name it, there are habitats that are very, very poorly um, explored. So I think, you know, elements of our work will perhaps be incremental insofar as we're, you know, we're adding to an existing picture. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm more interested in the situations where the picture and the questions that we're asking are, you know, utterly unlike what we envisioned. I think that's the most exciting thing when the perspectives really change. And I've seen that sort of over and over again, I guess, in my own field with discovery. So, you know, 2016, you said we, we met last. Um, and I think of the stuff we're working on right now, research questions. I mean, essentially, very little of that is, is uh, 
that we're, we're continuing on exactly along those lines. Some, some things are nearing conclusion, but it's a lot of brand new stuff, which is the most exciting part. So I don't, I don't know where we'd be in five or 10 years, and that's part of what I enjoy about it. Yeah, I, 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 it's great, I fully agree. Um, discovering more and more diversity, um, does it add to a kind of a framework of fundamental concepts of what does it need to become a cell? I think it does. There are lots of discoveries that have been made that change elements of what is required for you know the necessities of life, for sure. There's a lot of historical work on the minimal elements of, of a cell. What's the simplest genome, the simplest type of cell to survive? Um, And we're adding to that in, in different ways. But again, I think it's also these changing perspectives. We might have some sense in which you know, we have a minimal set of genes that are necessary for basic life. But it never ceases to amaze me you know, in a new environment, a new uh, situation, new symbiotic association between organisms, the diversity of ways that organisms can get by in those, in those environments. You wrote a very nice book uh, some years ago I think actually the, the German the German opening lecture of that book was here in Kiel. Uh, one plus one equals one. And uh, when I understand you now, does it mean that there are many ways to make the one? Um, is that what you what yes. you say? Yes, I w I think the answer to that is yes. So the. The one in one plus one equals one was the eukaryotic cell, so yeah, yeah. a nucleus-containing cell with, with a mitochondria and so forth. So I don't know that there's more than one way to make uh, a eukaryotic cell as we now define it, but what we have done is pushed the boundaries of what is possible. There are, there are eukaryotic cells that have been discovered with no mitochondria, which is something that, if I recall, when that book was published hadn't yet been been discovered um, and I would say it's it's one plus one plus one plus one uh, and on it goes equals one you know I, I think there are there are new elements to the sort of realm of symbiosis that I think are more and more coming into focus and need to be accounted for I would say the viruses are one of those things that even five years ago was perhaps not really on my radar But as someone who studies genome sequences, you simply cannot ignore uh, the viral contributions. Uh, and this is nothing new to, to virologists. Uh, microbial ecologists know that viruses you know, play incredible roles in population control and you know, all sorts of things. Um, but really, for me, as someone who spent a lot of time thinking about symbiotic theory, I now would work the viruses explicitly into the model of, of symbioses because they're very clearly plugged into the, the tree of life in ways that we didn't appreciate. Mm -hmm. That's a very uh, exciting view into the future, I think. And thank you so much, John, for coming. Very much looking forward to the lecture. And it's a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Thomas.